when I was that age, I didn't think about first and second. We did the same things, and let's admit it, we did the same things, but it was, uh, it was a secret to uh, discuss it when we got back into the dormitories of the fraternities, didn't brag about it. Your mothers are out there watching. They're watching roller derby, and then they change the channel. And this is you guys on the floor. They say, oh boy, they're really sick. Those poor kids. I don't think it any more is going on. I mean, you can only get to a certain point in sex and you can't go any farther, but I think it's just being brought out in the open more. People are talking about it. People are thinking about it. They're not sneaking off in corners and not telling their friends about it and being embarrassed about it. They're coming right out in the open. This is an examination of sex in the 60s. What is different about this scene? What changes are taking place? Dr. Mary S. Calderon, Executive Director, Sex Information and Education Council of the United States. We adults are frightfully hung up about sex. We've lived through a couple of eras. For instance, I brought children up, uh, two groups of children of my own, in two different eras, in the 20s and in the 40s. And it's, uh, it was two different worlds, quite literally. And changes in the 60s are once again completely different. We're seeing an explosion of sexual expression. Again, not just necessarily the in-bed expression, but in all of our communications media, for instance. And in all of our waking thoughts, waking music, and our waking reading, there's this tremendous explosion of almost obsession with sex, the genital aspects of sex. For example, you can see it in motion pictures. European films, and now American films, increasingly are showing nudity, couples in bed together, and they're dealing with formerly taboo subjects like homosexuality. In literature, partly as a result of the Supreme and Federal Court decisions on Fanny Hill and Lady Chatterley's Lover, there has been a great increase in books which treat sexual material. And, of course, we're seeing magazines and advertising which deal with sexual themes. The changes in public discussion and display of sex are easy to see. What is not so apparent are some of the differences in attitude towards sex on the part of the older generation in contrast to the younger generation. Psychologist Morton Schillinger, executive director of the Lincoln Institute for Psychotherapy, New York. The kids don't go to clubs with semi-nude waitresses. They don't go to playboy clubs, by and large. They don't go to burlesque. It's not a big kick to them. It's still a big kick to us. And I rather suspect that in some ways we're not happy with the fact that we're still hung up in this and they are not. I think we rather resent it. Our generation grew up with an enormous degree of preoccupation with looking. We grew up really as a generation of why yours. We were not supposed to look, we were not supposed to touch, we were not supposed to experience. And nevertheless, there was the very gradual lifting of the curtain, like the hemline, coming out of the Depression years. The, the advent of brassiere ads in the subways. The uh, small cues which were available to us, the very tame, but nevertheless occasionally avail available girly magazines on the newsstands. We grew up with this tremendous concern with looking, with finding what we wanted in, through our eyes, really, and acquiring the object. We uh, got into marriage, 
as a generation, we started having kids. And we decided that we were not going to do to our kids what happened to us, right? Make sure they're going to grow up healthy. To grow up healthy means that they should not suffer the same kinds of inhibitions and taboos and restrictions and artificiality that we had when we were kids. They were going to have the freedom to be themselves, to experience themselves, to explore, to taste life as we felt we were not allowed to do. But unfortunately, it's as if we um, started a car revved up, got it up to 50, 60, 70. We find ourselves over the crest of the hill going downhill, and now we go looking for the brake, and we find it's not there. We don't like the fact that the end product, the sum of what we set, set in motion, uh, causes problems for us, and it violates some of our own thinking about the way the world, the way the world should be. This is the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, a typical American university with a tradition of excellence. There are more than 30,000 students in attendance. It is homecoming weekend, a period when alumni return to visit alma mater. Today, there are six million college students in the United States. By 1972, there will be almost eight million. How are their attitudes different from their parents? What has happened to sex on campus? Psychologist Schillinger. Kids aren't scared of sex at this point. By comparison with the generation of their parents when they were adolescents. That doesn't mean that kids today don't have problems around sex, but they're different kinds of problems. They're not scared to talk about, about sex. They're not scared to um, exercise their curiosity, to investigate, to experiment. And we as a generation were. I think this is the most salient difference. I'm Shaw Livermore. I teach history here at the University of Michigan. I think we're aware today that, uh, that uh, students mature uh, faster than they might have 20 years ago and that there is probably more activity that one can reasonably call sexual activity. Uh, how any one person would know this, though, I don't have any idea. I think the critical factor of such things is uh, the privacy of the individual. It neither is anybody else's business, nor ought it to be anybody else's business. The critical matter is, however, whether students feel guilty about themselves, uh, whether they develop animosities toward people or feelings of inadequacy. Some have argued that, uh, uh, that students today in the 1960s are uh, less moral or conversely more immoral than uh, when I was in college 20 years ago. I have uh, no belief that this is so. When uh, I grew up, I dare say one talked less about uh, matters of uh, sex relationships, or you did it with a smile or a, uh, an embarrassed laugh more than, as I observe, students today are willing to. It's just remarkable to me the degree to which students will uh, bring up uh, quite dispassionately, but not uh, flippantly, uh, bring up uh, the considerations that uh, surround uh, a sexual relationship with someone else. Most high school girls, at least from the Midwest, grow up with the beautiful, pure ideal, I'm going to be a virgin when I marry. And this, in many cases, is never even tested until they get to college. Very and right. All of a sudden, yeah. here they are on this big campus, there are no parents, there's no church, there's nobody saying, no, you shouldn't do this. There's nobody saying, where are you going? When are you going to be your home? With mm -hmm. whom are you going? And she's here, and she's in it, thrust into a society, and she's dating usually older boys, and they are expecting an awful lot. I found when I was a freshman that the boys they dated were, ter I thought they were terrible. They just, you know, were very sex-minded. One of my <laughs> freshman friends had a button that said virginity is a state of mind and not a state of body. The only ones I've met who would like to have a virgin for a wife are Catholic boys after having been at this campus for four I don't think the guys 
Although the men on campus have decided whether they want to marry a virgin or not, I think it's kind of an irrelevant question right now in the girl that they marry. I don't think they sit it's around and think about it. Why is no. it irrelevant? I don't think, I think it's because, because, it's because they're not ready for it. They're not thinking about marriages? It may be that they're not thinking about marriage. It's just that when they set up a criteria for a wife, they're setting it up on a basis of, of intelligence, you know, personality, and they're not setting it up on whether she's a, a virgin or not. Now, that obviously implies that, that morally, or what they consider the morals, do not that they're broader-minded. I think it's the morals they per se care. they don't care about. Perhaps their attitudes. If you're perfectly them. willing to go along with your virginity and there's a reason, which is not just your religion or my mommy says so, or then fine. I don't think anybody will condemn it. And by the same token, it works the other way. Just, just the fact, if you are a virgin or not, they're more concerned, I think, with the mental link-up to if you are, why are you, and if you aren't, what is your philosophy behind not being Me, one? Exactly. You know. Exactly. Yeah. Many on campus see important values in the new liberal code. Graduate student Carolyn Toll. I find it very difficult to tell whether behavior has changed in the years, the last six or seven years. The only index we have of this is what people say, and more people talk about what they do, which might give the impression that people are freer. But personally, I don't believe that's the case. I think that the expectations that m men and women have on this campus for a relationship with each other are much higher than they were in my parents' generation. I think that people are seeking a level of, of communication that is very intense and very close. And the sexual um, familiarity between people is part of this whole intensity of, of communication. I don't think that people in my parents' generation ever really understood each other the way men and women are trying to understand each other now or knew each other on the kind of level they do now. And there's something very exciting about that kind of communication, which leads them into a sexual relationship, which wasn't as common in those times. But there are those who disapprove of the new sexual permissiveness. History professor Stephen Tonsor. Well, in dealing with all of these questions about uh, sexuality on the campus and off the campus, I would argue that uh, deeply involved is the problem of community and the search for community. Now, the one outstanding feature of our contemporary universities is that they want to shed responsibilities. They don't want any responsibilities. When I entered the Army, uh, the Army had to deal with the problem, let's say, of inducting uh, 30,000 sexually active men. Uh, the Army immediately did what it thought necessary to uh, provide a uh, minimum of education and protection. The university, on the other hand, uh, uh, doesn't feel it has any responsibility. Its responsibility is simply to turn its head, to avoid the question, to let students solve the problem for themselves. Uh, again, it seems to me that this is uh, evidence of a failure of community. And I don't think that parents or universities or adults can go on any longer uh, simply telling students to do or not to do something, to set up a, a set of flat rules, or to assume that they intend to have relations with each other unless they're prevented by adults or by institutions. I think that's all past, and a good thing it is. What they do want, however, is for someone to be around of some intelligence and some understanding of what's going on in the world today so that they might try out their own ideas or they might discuss implications of their acts. And this means that universities, particularly, are going to have to create a very different structure of relationship with students. And they're going to have to make available to students in a very easy and informal way uh, people who are older than the students, this might be graduate students or it might be young teachers, who will be available to talk but who will not be in the position of being policemen or of telling people what they can and what they can't do. Good morning, this is Planned Parenthood Association. Have you ever been to any of our Planned Parenthood centers before? Okay, uh, we have a clinic on Wednesday afternoon at 12.30. This is one of 383 Planned Parenthood clinics in the United States. 
There are, in addition, several thousand hospital clinics in America where sexual problems are dealt with on a routine basis. The doctor will then fit you for the contraceptive method most suited for you. How many children have you? We have two. We have two. Do you want any more? No. I would like to keep it just the way it is. Oh, and why? Well, we're sort of a middle-income family, and I would like to see both of them get a good education. And I eventually would like to go back to work. All right. There are many methods to prevent an unwanted pregnancy. There is the rubber used by the male during intercourse. There are various forms, jellies or creams that... Since 1965, dissemination of contraceptive information has been legal in all 50 states. ...by many women. There is the rhythm method, which is advocated by the Catholic Church, which is rather effective if used properly. Uh, it means not to... In this decade, the two most significant developments are what doctors call the IUD, intrauterine device, and the pill. Uh, among the newer methods, there is the IUD, or also known as the coil, or the loop, or the spiral, which is a device which has to be inserted into the womb of the woman by the physician. And it prevents pregnancy in a rather effective way. And last, and by no means least, is the pill. The pill really has revolutionized, in a social as well as medical way, the birth control picture in the last decade. Uh, the pill is available in, to women in this country at almost every level of uh, economics and education. Uh, the pill, to be sure, has to be prescribed by a physician. And a physician or a birth control clinic has to be in charge of the patient so that she can go there whenever she has any seeming questions or any difficulties with the pill. The first supply of pills is included in your initial fee. You can come in any time now and pick up as many as a six-month supply of pills. Still another development of this decade has been the founding of the first national voluntary organization made up of professionals and laymen, completely devoted to sexuality as a part of man's total health and well-being. The executive director, Dr. Mary Calderon. We feel that this organization and its phenomenally rapid growth and acceptance is an indication of the particular needs of the times. And I don't think that the time for it would have been 10 years ago, 15 years ago, or even five years ago. This was the moment when it needed to come into being to accomplish what needs to be done. What makes this moment so special? It's a very difficult moment to grow up in. It's a very difficult moment to bring children up in. In other words, that extraordinary process by which you take an infant at birth with all of his tremendous potentialities, not born a homosexual, not born a prostitute, not born a narcotics addict or an alcoholic, society makes them this way. This process is being impinged on, this process of nurture of the child to help him grow up to be the adult that he was meant to be, is being impinged on by a tremendous number of forces within, uh, within people themselves and also coming in from the world in general that is making the process of maturation extremely difficult and the process of developing sexual identity very much more difficult and sometimes distorted than it ever was. What I get from the young is a desperately hungry need to understand everything that life is about. And sex is certainly one thing that life is about. From when you're born until you're about 13, sex is a terribly dirty thing. Well, that's what they, that's what it seems like to you. You know, everything, if you find your father's Playboy or something, they say, no, you shouldn't look at that. That's daddy's and that's no good. And so naturally when you see someone with, you know, no clothes on or something when you're that young, you immediately that's bad. But then when you change and they start to tell you about sex when you're 13 or something, it's beautiful. That's the most wonderful thing in the world, and they try and change you right away, and all this other time they scared you against Well, it. who says it's bad up to age 13? Well, your parents do. <clears throat> they don't say it's bad. They just, everything that goes with it, with the know. idea. Maybe it's uh, tough for youngsters to talk to us because we hate to admit that we were just as foolish as they were. I think we've got to admit to them that we were stupid, too, and we just don't want them to make 
as many mistakes as often as we did. If the gap between generations seems to prevent easy discussion of sex inside the family, there are some attempts to deal with sex on an educational level, in schools and churches. This is a sex education course in the Flint, Michigan I public want schools. Feel free to ask me any question that comes to your mind. What questions about what? What are we going to talk about? Growth and development. Growing up and developing. Not just physically, but lots of other ways that you have grown and developed. I am George Chamis, coordinator of the Family Life Education Program, Flint Community Schools, Flint, Michigan. Sex education is only now beginning to scratch any surface in the United States. There, certainly, it is in its infancy. This is due primarily to a lack of uh, real concern among parents and educators, as well as a lack of adequate teacher preparation uh, for uh, providing this instruction in the public schools. Where in the body does the baby grow? In the uterus. Right. I'll give you another name for the uterus. uterus. Our program serves around 12 to 15,000 young people in the Flint area. The program consists of uh, family life and sex education for students through elementary and high school. Now, one thing I'd like to ask you fellows, the younger fellows, on your way down to the, uh, our offices tonight, uh, did your dad tell you anything about what you were going to discuss here with us? They mention anything to you. What did your daddy say to you? About the development of babies and the reproduction, and about um, the, how people grow and all that sort of stuff. Okay, did your father say something to you, Jim? <coughs> well, he didn't tell me anything, but I figured it was going to be about the growth of a baby in the hell. Okay, let me start out by asking you another question now. <clears throat> sex education in schools probably accomplishes several things. One is, it does help young people clear up what misconceptions they may have uh, accumulated over the years, primarily from their, their friends. Uh, it helps uh, with their own anxieties regarding their physical changes and development, uh, coming to grips with uh, the natural uh, sex process as it develops an individual. I think uh, providing certain basic information helps uh, the young people uh, cope with these anxieties and fears about becoming adults. Out of the work of the teachers, ministers, and scientists, there appears to be emerging a new definition of healthy sexuality. Man's sexuality as a health entity Sexuality is a very complex word. I don't think we have a total definition for it yet, simply because we have shortchanged this area of man's life and focused it strictly at the genital level. To me, sexuality isn't just a set of organs or hormones or a set of actions, particularly in bed actions. To me, sexuality has to do with who you are as a man, who you are as a woman, what you are as a man, what you are as a woman. How did you get this way? Through the long psychodynamic process that is sexual ma maturation from infancy upward. And most particularly, how you relate to other men and women. How you, as a man, relate to other men and, other, and women, or a man and a woman. You are a sexual person in every instant that you live, in everything that you do, you're not a non-sexual person. And so, to me, sexuality describes the thing that makes you a man and woman, your actions, your thoughts, your feelings, the past and the future. That's, to me, sexuality. What can be said in summary? There is little doubt that we are seeing an increased openness an increased permissiveness. Will this trend continue? Where are we heading? I think we're in an experimental period, a period of great flux in sexual morality. It's like when the uh, pagan codes of the Roman Empire disintegrated and the Christian codes weren't yet established. At an interim period. And in that interim period, when you see sex mores in flux, 
and changing all the time, it doesn't mean necessarily that we're in an age of decadence, that the morality is that everybody is uh, immoral. It means that you're not certain anymore about what the codes are or what the real base for them are. In wondering why the Playboy philosophy is making such a splash, I think it's because every man, every, every one of us, has a temptation. The temptation results in many phenomena, but one of the things it is, is be a boy. And here's a handbook of promiscuity called Entertainment for Men, but it's called Playboy. But what a grown woman does when she comes to a man, I think, is say, grow up. I don't want to marry a boy, I want to marry a man. And I think it's a fear of our capacities, a fear of the tremendous uh, challenge and risk it is to be a man in the 20th century, to live and move through this world like Doug Hammarskjöld, President Kennedy, and build this city that's all before us. We want to escape. I, 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 I hope I'm not being um, carping and uh, typical clerical response, playboy is no good. But I think modern men have to consider that this is a real waste of our manhood to retreat back into boyhood. I, I think that, that what's involved here, too, is the desire not to be involved. I mean, this is the whole uh, part of the whole picture of our time. Uh, we don't want to be involved. To get involved with another human being, with his emotions, with his uh, sorrows, with his joys, with his burdens, is to somehow have to bear them. And we don't want to do that. We just want to if we want to have fun or we want to play, but we don't want to really be involved. And so that you, you, you abstract sex right out of the whole personal, emotional uh, life of which it is a part, and you make it mechanistic. I've got a feeling that there is a, that there is a morality in, in the young today which is so much more honest and so much more straightforward and so revelatory of our hypocrisy that is the hypocrisy of the older generation, in which we've used all kinds of double standards, in which we have been willing to commit all kinds of human atrocities, on the one hand, while uh, uh, in a sense uh, uh, eating out our kids if they didn't live by a strict sexual morality or any other. And I think our children have seen through this hypocrisy and have called it for what it is, and that that's one of the reasons our sexual mores and morality in this world are going to be different. Because we're going to have to come clean on it, I think. And uh, we're going to have to, to take a good look at the ambiguity and the duplicity of so much of our morality today.